pharmacy is has your medication it's all ready to go you have to do one witness dose but you'll be given six carries okay this isn't your average call center the people on the other end of the line are desperate for help it sounds like he's been having multiple overdoses that are documented for albertans seeking help this call center is open seven days a week 12 hours a day Addiction counselors, social workers, and nurses assess each person to see how they can help them to stop using drugs. So then you you don't feel the need to use, you know what I mean? Which is exactly what Suboxone should, should do for you and Suboxone as well, as long as you're on the right dose, right? Is there another room like this elsewhere in the country? This is the only program I know of like this. It's based right here in central Alberta and Pinoca. Alberta's Minister of Mental Health and Addiction, Dan Williams, took us for a tour. He says people from anywhere in the province, from big cities to remote rural communities, can get help. We're treating thousands of Albertans every year, and they get that immediate same-day access to evidence-based medication that brings relief to them, and it allows those people who had no opioid addiction to have a, a, a gasp of air um, and, and lift out of their addiction for a moment and we hope, and it seems to be, this is the start of their journey on recovery. On average, the staff here connect about 19 people a day to a doctor who can prescribe Suboxone, which eases withdrawal symptoms, or Methadone, an opioid used to ease addictions. Mm -hmm. Dr. Nathaniel Day is the center's medical director. The reality is then we will shoot that prescription directly to the pharmacy that you've chosen, closest to where you live or work, and then you'll be able to go into the pharmacy, see the pharmacist, and start treatment today. Any idea of long-term outcomes for them? The fact of the matter is, is we see drug use go way down over time with the, with the patients that we care for, and we see overdoses go way down over time. It's like a hockey stick. Dr. Day was one of the authors of a study that concluded 90% of the people in this program have remained in treatment for six months. After 12 months, that number drops to 58%. That call centre in Pinoca and this treatment facility in Red Deer are two examples of what the provincial government calls the Alberta model, focusing on treatment and recovery as the best way to tackle the drug crisis. So this is the gathering space. This is where our, uh, our main community meetings happen. With its airy public spaces, from a gleaming gym to a theatre room, this addiction treatment centre feels less like a health institution and more like a nice motel. Um, so we have single occupancy and double occupancy rooms yeah. and being able to get into a single occupancy room is one of these things that you move along in the process. You know, so Open nine months ago, up to 75 men and women can stay here at no cost to them. This is one of two new publicly funded addiction treatment centres in Alberta. The other is in Lethbridge. In all, the province plans to build a total of 11 over the next three years. In total, they could treat more than 2,000 people a year. The government says it's added 10,000 treatment spaces since 2019. I almost lost custody of my children, and I was able to do intake through a phone and call. The facility arranged for us to speak with three residents. Given the stigma around addiction, we agreed not to show their faces. And how long did you have to wait between the time you made the call and the, you could walk through the door? Only about a week. Yeah. which is unheard of, really, usually waiting lists for months and months. The government says wait times are always changing, but when people get into the centre, they can get treatment for up to a year. The connections that I've made is, is huge, right? When, when you have the short-term pro programs, it's, it's easy just to fall back into the same people and the same crowd. You're eight months here. How do you feel about, about your prospects after you leave here? Um, I just know that if I do the things I need to do here, and bring them into my, you know, my life when I leave, I have a very good chance of succeeding. But addiction is often a lifetime struggle. Will more treatment spaces in Alberta significantly reduce the number of people taking illicit drugs? What data do you have on the Alberta model? Is it too early? Do you have numbers that say that the Alberta approach is actually making things better? So the data is that we see 10,000 new spaces, almost all of which is full in Alberta, and we see thousands of lives of people who otherwise would have um, been through addiction that are now living in recovery. The government concedes it doesn't yet have the data on the impact of the Alberta model, but Williams makes it clear. He believes treatment 
is the solution to the toxic drug crisis. The only way out of this is if at a large scale, a government comes in and says, we know that recovery is a path off of addiction. If you don't build a very expensive and sophisticated system around recovery, of course you're going to continue to see more deaths. But for all the optimism about access to treatment, a grim number hangs over the province. 1,706 people in Alberta died from illicit drug poisonings in the first 11 months of 2023, the most recent number available. That's more than five Albertans every day. Lives which many experts say won't be saved by making addiction treatment the focus. You must find all of this very frustrating. Yeah, I think like to be focused so much on preserving what we have and mm -hmm. to not expanding or um, trying new things, it's, it is extremely frustrating. And like I said, the statistics really show that we're not doing enough. And Elaine Hishka is a professor at the University of Alberta whose research focuses on the public health approach to substance abuse. Alberta is boldly focusing on treatment. But do they have it right? I don't think anyone that says there's one solution to the problem of drug poisoning has it correct. And if you look at our statistics, the numbers speak for themselves. We are on track to lose potentially over 2,000 people this year, more people than we've ever lost in Alberta. And so I don't think our current policy approach is working. And I think evidence-based public health approach would include not just effective treatment, um, but also harm reduction. We are not taking that comprehensive approach and I think we're seeing the results. Harm reduction is one of the pillars of British Columbia's response to the drug crisis, including supervised areas to take drugs and providing to some a so-called safer supply of uncontaminated drugs. BC believes that approach can save lives. Alberta's United Conservative Party is adamantly opposed to safer supply, saying it facilitates drug use and ultimately drug deaths. At the party's annual general meeting last November, members voted to end provincial funding of supervised consumption sites. It's not binding, but it does reflect how the UCP feels about harm reduction. Do you think politics is what's driving the approach of the government here? Yes, yeah. I mean, I mean, politics drives the approach of all governments um, to some extent. But I think in the last few years in Alberta, we have seen a lot more politicization of the issues. The best thing that we could do is bring people indoors to safe sites. In Edmonton, outreach groups, independent of government, are trying to fill the gaps. We want to encourage everybody, if you don't have an naloxone kit with you, do you want to take one? Chanel Twan invited us yeah. to join her team as they walked the downtown streets. Yeah. Okay, so there's foil, push stick, water, cookers, sharps, pretty much everything you're going to need. They're focused on what people who use drugs need right now to stay alive. And do you need anything else? Straight shooter kit, rig kit, naloxone, straight shooter kit? Those kits contain clean pipes to smoke drugs. They also hand out naloxone or Narcan, which can be injected to revive someone poisoned by drugs. So we're going to put the tip of the needle now in the bottom of the juice, and we're going to suck it up. So I'm going to let you do it. Okay, you want to take that? You can push, point it down. In 2016, we lost 353 uh, people here in Alberta, and so that's almost one a day. Now here in Alberta in 2024, we're losing five people a day. We know the numbers are a little bit more dire in British Columbia, but it's just, it's gotten worse and worse and worse. And we're out here literally with naloxone, um, trying to put naloxone on bullet holes. In Edmonton, like many cities in Canada, drug use is sometimes very public and deeply disturbing. On top of having supplies, can we get everybody some naloxone? And in the age of fentanyl, one you hit you can be deadly. Will more treatment help address this? Immediately, if we're talking about bringing people indoors and saving lives tomorrow, it's safe consumption sites and safe supply that are going to save lives. But I think the government here in this province would say increasing access to treatment, increasing treatment facilities is the answer. I would tell those government officials uh, and I would invite them to come and have a walkabout like you're doing today and, um, and hopefully maybe that will help them open their hearts and minds to the reality that folks are actually dealing with out here. 
you brought some pictures of Lakota, and I just wonder if you can tell me what memories they bring to mind. He was so handsome. <laughs> yeah. He was a really handsome kid. Every death from drugs has a story. And U of A assistant professor Sarah Auger wanted to tell us the story of her son, Lakota, who died just before Christmas of 2022. This is actually probably my favorite picture of him. Um, he's with his daughter. He was a father, a loving son. He was also a binge drinker who sometimes used drugs. Auger believed Lakota needed to hit rock bottom to turn his life around. She was wrong. The rhetoric around abstinence and sobriety and recovery and all that is you have, you know, you have to hit rock bottom. And as a parent, you've got to practice tough love. Sometimes rock bottom kills, often, right now, in, you know, in the province and the country today, rock bottom kills. Lakota lost his apartment and moved in with his mom. But when he started using again, she said he had to leave. Yeah. She believed the yeah. answer to her son's demons was to just stop using alcohol and drugs. That was my focus with him. Just get him sober and he'd be okay. There are so many things I know today that if I had known differently then, I would have absolutely approached his use differently. What would have saved his life? Options. Options. If he had known about harm reduction measures, would he have used them? The answer is I don't know. But he should have had the option presented to him because I do believe he wanted to live. Lakota is part of that tragic statistic, the growing number of Albertans killed by toxic, illicit drugs. I asked Alberta's Minister of Mental Health and Addiction if these deaths prove his government's approach to the drug crisis is too narrow, that it should include supplying access to a so-called safer supply. Do you need to be adding another part to this approach that says, yes, treatment, yes, recovery, yes, some version of harm reduction, but even more because we're clearly not reaching those five people a day? What has brought us to this crisis is the exact logic and reason that they say we need to double down on. Safe supply will not solve the problem. There's no... But it'll keep people alive, won't it? It will not. Safe supply will facilitate more addiction. I don't believe safe supply in the least is any version of harm reduction. What I say to Canadians watching this unfold on both sides is we have a choice in front of us. There, is, there are clear lines drawn. Um, is it that handing drugs out to drug addicts and the model of harm production that it's become is the path forward? Or is it going to be investing heavily in recovery so we don't see any more of those scenes on the street that you saw yesterday? These folks are all people that come from our community that we love, that we have relationships, that are no longer here, that we miss. After Chanel Tuan took us on a tour of those streets, there was one more thing she wanted to show us. Every one of these faces, each card, is from a funeral or memorial she's been to. We don't have enough room to show you who all our friends are, but all of our friends are gone. And, um, Every card, a son, daughter, in many cases a father or mother, most of them killed by poison drugs. We will continue to keep showing up. Um, in light of inaction, and we will continue to keep filling these gaps as we see them. Um, but we don't want to see anybody else's loved ones added to this um, pile. We would uh, obviously tell Canadians, please don't wait to give a shit about other people until it's somebody that you're connected to, to somebody that you love. Whatever the solution, each one is a reminder of the overwhelming loss. With no sign, the crisis is easing.